Hello everyone, we're glad you were able to join us today for our webinar. My name is Virginia Birkenkotter. I'm the Delivery Director over the Higher Education Practice at ACF Solutions. And our topic today is Dream to Reality, Achieving Data-Driven Marketing and Automation. And the reason our topic is uh, the one that we selected today is because increasingly at ACF, we are working with organizations that want to replace existing email marketing tools um, with new solutions that are enabling data-driven marketing automation. And one of the things that we know to be true is that with Salesforce CRM and tools such as Pardot or Marketing Cloud, uh, it affords our clients an amazing opportunity to take communication to the next level at their organization. But there is work to be done with this, and part of that work um, for preparing for transformation involves identifying uh, both the right data to drive these communications and the right automation approach. So our goal with this session is going to be to look at two key considerations. The first is how to best capture and aggregate the data that you're going to need to personalize and target communications. And the second is identifying the right opportunities and solution for marketing automation. So again, welcome, we're glad you're here and we can go ahead and get started. I'm joined today by two panelists, um, both a client, a partner, and a friend, Kim Egan, who is um, the Director of Electronic Communications at the University of Colorado System, as well as Watt Hamlet, Hamlet fe a fellow colleague at ACF Solutions. He's been with us for four years serving as a solution architect. But before that, Watt has spent um, the majority of his illustrious career working specifically with online engagement and marketing automation for higher ed and nonprofits. Before we get started, I'm just going to tell you a brief little bit about ACF Solutions in case you're not familiar. We were founded in 2003, and our sole focus is on higher education and nonprofit. We are um, pleased to be a Salesforce org preferred partner, as well as a Salesforce Silver Consulting partner since 2015. Okay, so before we get started, we want to learn a little bit about you all. Um, we know we have a lot of different people on the call from different industries, different sectors. Um, and so we're going to ask two quick poll questions to get to learn a little bit about you. So the first one is, uh, what, are you, what org type of organization are you with? Are you with a nonprofit, higher ed, or other? And I'll give you just a moment to respond, so please, if you can go ahead and fill that out, that would be great. Okay, great. So I think you're all seeing the results. Uh, it looks like the majority of you are with a higher ed institution, but a fair majority, my, a fair number are with nonprofits as well as others. So thank you very much. And one more quick poll question we want to ask is, uh, what, what, <laughs> what is your primary area of focus? So marketing communications, fundraising advancement, recruiting and mission student services, IT or other? Okay, great. Thank you so much. So it looks like we've got a fairly even split between IT, marketing communications, but also some fundraising and advancement as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So regardless of your role at your organization, um, I'm confident that you're going to find this information that we're sharing with you today uh, valuable. Uh, we would also like to take some time at the end to answer any of your questions, so feel free to, in the questions panel, write whatever questions you would like, and we have plenty of time at the end set aside to do that. Now, next I would like to introduce Kim Egan to share a mini case study with us. Kim? Hi, everyone, and thanks, Virginia. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, before I tell you about CU's econ program, um, I would like to share a short three-minute video. If your department is like mine, you probably send emails to a ton of people, inside and outside the university. Sometimes you ask them to come to campus events, training classes, or fundraisers. You try to keep track of all this with lists. Lists to follow up on, lists of people to add or remove. Wouldn't you like some help? Ecom can help you do a better job of reaching the right people, attracting them to your events, and getting help when you need it. How do you get to the right people? You start with the right data. Ecom draws from CU's major databases to provide current, accurate, and secure data. You might already be using tools like MailChimp, Constant Contact, Listservs, Outlook, or even Excel to manage your data. Using these tools can lead to problems with security, bad data, and email fatigue. 
This also takes a lot of your time, and before you know it, your information is out of date. Ecom provides access to up-to-date, detailed information on the people you want to reach, so you don't have to worry about who moved, who got a new email address, or who graduated. When you spend less time managing lists, you can spend more time crafting great communications. Ecom can help with that too. Ecom has a variety of email template options that all follow CU branding guidelines. Your recipients get emails that look good on any device and are less likely to be marked as spam. They can even manage their email subscriptions on their own. This all means less work for you. But how do you know that your message is getting through? Ecom makes it easy to find out who actually opens and reads your emails. Plus, it tracks if they're doing what you ask them to do, like visiting your website, joining your membership club, or registering for your event. Speaking of events, Ecom helps you there too. Better data means your invitations get to the right people with the right information to register, pay for, and attend your event. That's right, Ecom offers secure payment processing as well. As you can see, Ecom gives you access to a lot of great tools and data. But what really makes it your best option for communication is the dedicated support. Each campus has a full-time Ecom specialist to help you get up and running and answer your questions. And they'll stay with you after you're on your feet, providing ongoing support and sending new tips, tricks, and best practices. This is why Ecom is CU's preferred communication tool. It's better email, better events, and better data. So, are you ready to get started? Contact your campus ecom specialist to learn more. Thanks, Watt. Um, so, there was a little bit of a delay for me in terms of um, the voiceover and the video. So, I, I hope that you all are able to check out the video on your own. Again, we'll provide a link to it at the end of the session, as well as in the follow-up communications. Um, but we use this video to help explain what our program is and what it offers. Um, again, we call our program ECOM, short for Electronic Communications. Um, so before I tell you a little bit more about ECOM, I'll tell you a little bit about the University of Colorado. We have about 43,000 students, 40,000 employees, and 300,000 alumni. And for those alumni, those are with active email addresses. We have many hundreds more alumni, but that 300,000 we have good email addresses on. So we communicate to both internal audiences, so our employees and our students, as well as to external employees, so our alumni and donors. So that means we have to um, stay compliant with CAN spam in very unique ways for both of those audiences. Ecom has been around for about nine years, but we went system-wide across our four campuses as well as advancement and system offices about five years ago. Our previous solution sunsetted and we had to find a replacement. After three RFPs and trying to find something that fit our needs and was able to allow us to grow and keep up with industry trends and best practices, we finally, of course, selected Salesforce. So our econ suite of tools includes Salesforce for our CRM, Marketing Cloud, obviously, for our email marketing solution, and Cvent for event management. ACF served as our implementation partner to build out Salesforce and Marketing Cloud. We partnered with the flagship campus in Boulder, Colorado, who is already building out a Salesforce org. We decided to not replicate the issues that we were trying to fix with ecom which was create yet another communication island with siloed data. By adding Ecom to an existing Salesforce org that had existing users and programmatic support from leadership, we were able to take that Salesforce org enterprise or system-wide. Currently, we support about 260 users across CU. We have a team of 12 who are campus employees, and they run the program on their campuses. They not only train, but they provide tier one support to their users. They're very busy. We just launched these three solutions to our 260 users in early February. So we're very much in the crawl phase now, or I guess in the walking phase. But since February 1st, we've sent nearly 13 million emails. We have over 150 CVENT event forms and have generated nearly $100,000 in event registration revenue. 
In Salesforce, we have about 300 fields that are unique to e-com, allowing our communicators to engage their constituents in targeted and strategic ways. Our old e-com solution was built on a flat database and was very much a click and send type of tool, making it very easy for our communicators to send everything to everyone. With Marketing Cloud, we very much want to move away from that mentality and use it to engage constituents based on who they are and what actions they have taken, such as registering for an event, donating, or even opening an email. The next step in our e-com journey is to take advantage of all of what Marketing Cloud has to offer, specifically using data to drive communication. So with that, I'll hand it over to Watt who will provide a roadmap for how to make this a reality. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, for, for sharing your story. And ACF has been really pleased to be your partner uh, through, through the journey that you've gone on there at CU to this point and then are happy to, to be continuing to work with you. So what Kim described represents one facet of our topic today, and that is around data. So as you think about moving towards more automated data for your organization to drive your communications, you've really got to think about what data that is and how you're going to get it centralized so that you can make use of it in the same way that, that CU has done. That's topic number one. Topic number two is around automation. So once you have that data centralized, what can you do to begin to drive more uh, automated communication in increasingly sophisticated ways? So in an effort to help you navigate those two areas, ACF has put together what we're calling our Dream to Reality Checklist. And what you can see here are really seven items that we recommend organizations be prepared to address that them use their data better to drive and ultimately automate effective communication. And our focus today is specifically on using Salesforce as your CRM as the point of aggregation and then making use of that data through one of the Salesforce connected marketing tools, namely either Marketing Cloud or Pardot. So we're going to be, be moving through each of the items on this checklist as we go through the rest of the call today. Uh, but before we do that, it's just, I think, always good to remember why this is important, why does this matter, and I would guess those of you who have joined the call already have some sense of why this is important, but, you know, research shows and I think our own experience as individuals confirms that the more that uh, people communicate with us in ways that are targeted and relevant to who we are, what we're interested in, our experiences, the more relevant that information is and the more likely we are to read and to respond to that information. And then in terms of automation, it really becomes a matter of scaling and becoming more efficient. The more you can automate your communication touch points, the better chance you have at a more efficiently addressing and engaging with larger and larger numbers of constituents. So as we turn to our first topic, which is around data, we'd like to present you another question. So if you'll take a look at your screen, we'd like to understand where your organization or institution is today when it comes to consolidating your constituent data into a centralized CRM. Are, are folks on the call today at the very early stages of just thinking about it? Um, have you started to do it, but, or have you planned to do it, but you haven't started yet? Are you in the middle of it? Or are you, are you already all in and making great use of automation? So take a moment to think about where your organization or institution is and, and share that with us in the poll response. Okay, great. So it looks like, interestingly, a lot of people are in the middle of it. Um, so hopefully for those of you who are early stages, this will give you a nice blueprint to, to, to follow. For those of you who are in the middle, maybe some confirmation around things you're already doing and some things that you may need to look ahead toward. So let's start with the first item on the checklist, which is identifying what types of data you're going to need. So typically, we find this breaks out into three main areas of data. The first is biodemo data, basic information about the individuals you're communicating with, their name, their email address, maybe some other details about them like 
their date of birth or their gender. If you're higher ed, this might be something like um, their SAT score or what their major is. Or if you're in fundraising, uh, this might be uh, a, wealth, a wealth screening score. So that's one facet of the data that you're going to need to centralize. The second type is preference or interest data. What does this person care about? How do they want to be communicated with? If you're uh, in higher ed recruiting, you know, is this a, a prospective student who's interested in engineering or nursing? You need to know that distinction to be able to communicate with them in the right way. If they're a donor, uh, are they interested in funding research or scholarships? What kind of mailing list do they want to be on? And this information can both be implied and it can be expressed. So someone might fill out a form on your website telling you that they have an interest in environmental research. So that's, that's an expressed interest. Or they might respond to a donation campaign uh, around raising funds for the environment. And so that's an implied interest because they gave to that campaign. We can imply that the environment is among their interests. So preference and interest data is another key data type to think about consolidating for your communication purposes. And then the third area is what we call interaction or engagement data. So what have these individuals done relative to your organization or institution? Have they attended events? Have they filled out an application? Have they participated in one of your programs? Have they volunteered? Have they donated? All of these are representative of the types of interactions or engagements that you'll want to be able to again, consolidate so you can make use of it for your communication purposes. The second item on the checklist is figuring out where all that data lives in your organization today. And for most organizations, the answer is it lives in a lot of different places. Almost every organization has what we would call a big system. For nonprofits, that's typically your donor database. For higher ed, it could be your advancement system, your student information system, or some other type of ERP system. This is where you've got a, a lot of core information about your constituents, and, um, and it's going to be important to have access to that data to do the kind of communication that's going to, it's going to help drive automation. But that's typically not the only place that information lives. So you probably have across your organization some access databases or some MySQL databases that have been set up over time for program management or volunteer management or corporate relations. You've got uh, Excel sh sheets that exist out there that have lists of event attendees or volunteer signups. You've got people in your institution uh, who in their Outlook or Gmail uh, contact list have the names of, of people that you'll want to be able to reach. This is particularly true for anyone who's, uh, who's outward facing in your organization, fundraisers, people in corporate relations, and so forth. Through your website, you've probably got some online forms where you've been collecting uh, data, signups, or that kind of thing, or maybe you've got an online portal where your constituents are interacting today that's providing a uh, source of data for you. And then there's going to be a whole lot of other systems, uh, event systems, maybe other email systems that exist out there. Um, and, and, and so it's important with, as you take a look at your organization to really take the time to figure out where that data is because the more of that information you can consolidate, the better you'll be able to holistically communicate with your constituents. But there's one other important source of constituent data that you'd never want to forget about, and that's your constituents. So you need to put in place a plan for how you're going to continue to evolve the information you already have about existing constituents, to collect updated preference information from them, to continue to be able to track the kinds of engagements that they're carrying out with your organization, and to continue to grow your list and collect new information about new constituents. So that's step two on the checklist, determining where the data lives today. The next step is deciding how you're going to get that data. Now, in some situations, you may be able to replace some or maybe even all of those other systems with Salesforce itself. So we're working with organizations that are moving their fundraising systems into Salesforce. 
Um, they're retiring some of those access systems and Excel spreadsheets and, and event systems and so forth and are, and are powering all of that directly out of Salesforce. So that's great. If you can, if you can get rid of those other silos, um, you're, you're that much closer to having a, a single consolidated data set. But most organizations are still going to have some other data sources that they're going to need to feed into Salesforce to support data consolidation. So the question of how will you get that data is really two questions. It's how will you get that data as well as how will you get that data. So the first question is really more of a technical one. What is the process you're going to use to get data from your various spreadsheets or flat files or even your other systems into Salesforce? Are you going to do some sort of manual import export process on a periodic basis? In some cases, you may be using uh, systems that already have a connector to Salesforce. Salesforce has a big eco ecosystem. A lot of systems, particularly things like event systems, uh, have pre-built connectors that are going to help facilitate getting information from those systems into Salesforce. For other systems, you may need to put in place some type of middleware, some software, uh, typically called an ETL tool, that's going to help you move data from those existing databases into Salesforce and maybe also move things back out of Salesforce into those systems. How often does that data need to be exchanged? Is it something that changes frequently such that you need to move it once a day? Or is it something that can be moved more on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis? So these are some of the decisions you'll need to make about technically how you'll go about getting the data into Salesforce. And then the other question to ask is how will you get that data? Who actually in your organization owns the data and are you allowed to have it? Are there policies that govern the use of data in your organization? Are you allowed to read that data? Can you write back to that data? So this really points to the importance of data governance within your organization or institution. If you don't already have data governance in, in place, the introduction of a CRM is usually the right occasion to do that. And we also find that to the extent that your organization hasn't begun to think through these things, this can become a pretty significant roadblock towards your uh, progress of, of driving data-driven communication. So start asking those questions now as you, as you consider the various data sources you want to consolidate. In every case, be sure you have clear understanding of who, who feels like they own that data and, and what the policies are regarding your use of it. Okay, so once you've, uh, once you've figured out how you're going to get the data in Salesforce, then the next step is figuring out how to structure it inside of Salesforce to get the most out of it for your marketing purposes. So Salesforce is a great CRM for people to log into and see information about your constituents, but from a marketing perspective, your needs are a little special in that you're going to ultimately need that data to be stored in a way that it can easily be shared with the marketing system. So you're going to want to make sure that you have the right data model inside of Salesforce to make this as easy on you as you can. So it's important to understand the concept of one-to-one -one data as well as one-to-many data. So we think back to uh, our earlier slide about the types of data that will be living in Salesforce. Biodemo data is a great example of one-to-one. -one. Things like name, email address, mailing address, state, uh, uh, date of birth, that information uh, typically lives right on the contact record in Salesforce. And then if you think about interaction or engagement data, so things that people do with or for your organization, events they go to, student enrollments, donations that they make, advocacy actions, membership, those are great examples of one-to-many type records. So if you see on the right-hand side of the diagram, we've got a single contact record that's tied to multiple event records, that's tied to multiple enrollment records. So you'll invariably have some of that data inside of Salesforce as well. And then the third type of data, that preference or interest data, that could, that could live in either place. Depending on how complex the preference and interest information is, it could live directly on the contact. Or as you heard, as you heard Kim say, it's at CU across the, the uh, university system there, they had hundreds of preferences and interests they need to maintain. So in that case, it really was more manageable to set that up as 
uh, as a set of related records or one-to-many one records. So as much as possible, when you think about aggregating your data in Salesforce, you'll want to get as much of that on the contact record as you can. That will make it easiest for you to work with it in your marketing system. Now, both uh, Marketing Cloud and Pardot can also support you building communications out around these related records, but it costs you more to do so. In the case of Marketing Cloud, the cost is more or less in time. You have to go into Marketing Cloud and create what are called data extensions, basically tables that you build out in Marketing Cloud to host this relate, related data. Um, and it's something you'll have to you know, set up once and then, and then maintain over time so as information, the, the data structure changes in Salesforce, you'll need to update that in the Marketing Cloud as well. Pardot also supports related data, but in order to take advantage of that, you'll need the ultimate edition of, of uh, Pardot, which comes with, with the highest price tag. So, so the more you can consolidate on the contact record, the, the easier and more cost effective it will be. But again, you, you most likely are going to also need to reference some of this related data. Now there's a, there's a third uh, way of maintaining data in Salesforce that um, can often help you get around having to use the related data, and that's what's called uh, variously um, calculated fields or formula fields or roll-up. So you notice here on my contact record, I've got a field that says number of events attended. Um, I also have uh, what, what's called an engagement score. So there are situations where you can actually uh, do some kind of roll-up or calculation across these related records that may be sufficient for you in your marketing purposes. And what it really comes down to is when you're sending out your marketing and communications, is it important for you to know specifically the details around a particular type of interaction that someone attended this event or gave to this campaign or enrolled in this program, or is it sufficient just to know that someone attended the event or that someone enrolled or that someone gave? If it's the latter case, you can get by with that data living right on the contact. Otherwise, you'll need to accommodate that through a one-to-many data model and then um, use uh, the, the tools within Marketing Cloud and Pardot so that you can replicate the data from these related records into those systems. All right, so we've identified the data that we need, which systems it lives in, we've figured out how it's gonna live in Salesforce, we've gotten it into Salesforce, and now we need to connect that data from the Salesforce CRM to the marketing system. And one point I just wanna make here is that Salesforce and these marketing systems are separate databases, even though they all are part of the Salesforce family and our Salesforce clouds, they are separate databases. So just as with moving data from your other systems into Salesforce, you'll also need to move data from Salesforce into these marketing systems. So fortunately though, in both cases, there exists a connector that you can take advantage of that has prepackaged the integration. So what do you get when you, when you make use of the connector? So from the data that moves from Salesforce into the marketing system, there's primarily three kinds of information. There's your core contact and lead data. There's uh, campaign or campaign and report data. And then there are those related objects. So contacts and leads, those are your people records in Salesforce. Um, for uh, for Marketing Cloud, you're able to reference records inside of Salesforce campaigns and inside of Salesforce reports. So for example, you can send an email out of Marketing Cloud that uses the results from a Salesforce report or Salesforce campaign as your, your list for that mailing. With Pardot, you only get campaigns. So you're able to, to point a Pardot email send to a Salesforce, a set of Salesforce campaign members However, you cannot point Pardot directly to a report, so that's a, that's a consideration for that system. And then as we mentioned as well, to the extent that you've got those one-to-many records that you need to replicate into the marketing system, the connector will handle uh, pushing that data from Salesforce into the various marketing systems. All right, and then coming back from the marketing system into Salesforce, there's a couple of types of data that are that's supported by the connector. 
So anytime you've got new contacts or leads that are being created in those marketing systems, they'll come back into Salesforce. And then uh, activity records related to constituents' activity through the marketing platform. So for example, uh, if someone opens an email or they click a link in an email, that's a type of activity that can be sent back across from both Marketing Cloud and Pardot into Salesforce. And then in the case of Pardot, there's additional data such as lead scores and lead grades uh, and other online activity like page visits and so forth. That's also included as part of the activity data. So there's connectors available for both systems and there's predefined types of data that move from Salesforce to the marketing system and from the marketing system into Salesforce. All right, so that takes us through the first five items in our checklist and really covers us on the topic of data. So you've identified your data, you've moved it into Salesforce, and now Salesforce is talking to your marketing system and your marketing system is talking to Salesforce. So that's, uh, that, that's great, uh, and that's, and that's in and of itself is not trivial, as you can probably uh, imagine, or as those of you who are going through this probably know from your experience. Um, and then from there, once, once you've got that, those basic pieces in place, it's time to think about how you might start to use these tools to help you automate your communication. So once again, we'd like to put the question out to you. As you uh, think about your own organization or institution, where are you today in the area of marketing automation? Do you already have Marketing Cloud or Pardot and you're using it to automate your communications? Are you using some other system and are automating communication? Do you have Marketing Cloud or Pardot but you aren't automating or do you have some other marketing system that are, and are not yet automating? So take a, take a moment to view the screen now and um, respond with where you are in your organization or institution on this topic. So it looks like no one has uh, yet gotten to the point of fully automating with Marketing Cloud or Pardot. And in general, there's not a lot of, lot of automation going on. Okay, very helpful. And one last question we'd like to post to you today. And for those of you who said you are, you are doing some level of automation, choose, choose which of the options here that, that you're, you're actually doing. I think for a lot of people, the answer will probably be none to speak of. But for those of you who are doing some automation, um, which, of the, which of these types are you doing? And if, and if those types don't make sense to you, hang tight. We're going we're gonna to define those for you in just a moment. So it looks like um, some folks are actually doing some, some of the more sophisticated types of pathway splits or journeys, some welcome series, some triggered sends, and then most people aren't, aren't doing very much. Okay, very good. So, um, so, so two things we want to highlight as part of, as part of the, the checklist here as you get into the area of automation. The first is understanding the types of automation that are available through these marketing tools. And you know, I think it's very helpful to understand that there's not a single definition or a single type of automation, but it really represents uh, what, what, you know, what I see is really four different approaches that you can take, and each one is, is increasingly sophisticated and complex. So let's take a moment to, to define uh, these options for you. So the first is called a triggered send, and I think we're probably all familiar with this concept, which is our take some kind of action, and that action results in an email being sent out. So that could be as basic as they uh, make a donation online and they get a thank you email in response, or they sign up for an event and they get a thank you message. They fill out a form on our website with their preferences and they get an email in response to that. Um, so that's, that's a form, a very basic form of communication automation and something you certainly should, should, uh, should, should do if you're not doing already. Um, and both Pardot and Marketing Cloud will support you here. In Pardot, this is called a completion action. In, in Marketing Cloud, it's called a triggered send. And the other thing with this particular type of automation is that you don't even necessarily need a marketing platform to do this. This is supported directly from Salesforce uh, through, through workflow rules. So for different types of, of actions your constituents may be taking, if that's updating data in Salesforce, that can uh, trigger out an email to the constituent through 
a Salesforce workflow rule. So don't forget to, to consider how you might take advantage of, of, of just core Salesforce functionality for these basic kinds of triggered sounds. The next type of auto automation as we kind of move down the scale here is, is a one-time scheduled sequence. So if you notice in the, in the imagery that we have here, you've got three different points in time, and at each point in time, an email is going out. So the basic idea with the scheduled sequence is that it's calendar driven. So you've decided, let's say for example, you're going to be uh, holding an event. So on the first of the month, you want an email to go out to your list announcing the event. On the 15th of the month, you want a ne the next email to go out reminding people of the event. And then the third, the third email goes out on the last day of the month, letting people know it's their last chance to register. So what this requires is being able to create your email messages and then schedule them on a calendar to go out automatically on the appointed date. And both Marketing Cloud and Pardot will support you in doing this, and, and actually a lot, of, a lot of email marketing platforms today will support this type of, uh, of messaging automation. The third type looks very similar to the second type, except you'll notice in addition to the, the points in time in our flow, we have a little gear icon between each step. So this is an example of of an automated sequence where we've got some basic responsiveness accommodated in the sequence. So we're still saying we want messages to go out in a certain sequence at a certain point in time. However, between the first message and the second message, we're going to have something happen. And that's typically doing an evaluation to determine if the constituent still meets the criteria to receive the next message in the sequence. So in our prior example, let's say you send out an email on the first of the month to invite people to register for your event. Before the second message goes out, you want to look back at your list, and for anybody who has not yet registered for the event, send them email number two. If they have already registered, they're good. You don't need to send any additional email. And then the next step of the sequence would do the same level of, level of evaluation. So this is a kind of a combination of a calendar-driven automation, but you also are doing, uh, you're doing some constituent evaluation at each point in the process. And again, within, um, within Pardot and the Marketing Cloud, this is uh, a supported type of automation. With Pardot, it's supported through what are called drip programs, and that's something that's included with all versions of Pardot. And within Marketing Cloud, this is supported through what's called Automation Studio. And Automation Studio is available with the Pro Edition of Marketing, Marketing Cloud and above. All right, and then the fourth type of automation is the one that gets all the love and all the attention, which is an automation sequence that has pathway splits. This is also commonly referred to as journeys. So now we don't just have a linear sequence of email messages, but we have a very complex uh, set of decision points that drive different outcomes based upon different constituent actions. So sticking with our same example, we send out our email to everyone we want to invite to the event, and then we get to a second point in time and we have a decision split. If people open and completed the registration, they get one message. And if they open the email and did not complete the registration, they get a second message. So we're not here looking only at registration activity, we're also looking at email open activity. And then for those who get that second email encouraging them to register, if they open and they complete the registration, they get, uh, they get a, a, an email response. And if they don't, then some other action happens. And this could be uh, this could be any, any manner of things. Maybe we're going to actually assign a task to someone on staff to now pick up the phone and try to call that person. Um, so this, is, this represents really the most complex type of automation that's supported within the tools today. Again, with Pardot, this would be supported through drip programs, just the same as with the prior example, and it's available in all Pardot editions. With Marketing Cloud, you would now need the tool they call Journey Builder, and this is sold um, either as an add-on or if you're, if you're licensing the corporate or enterprise editions, it's included with those, with those packages. 
All right, so that's a, that's a look at the, the, the four basic approaches to automation. And now we've gotten to the final step in our checklist, which is really, really a word of advice, which is to take a walk, jog, run approach to automation within your organization. For those of you who have seen demos of Pardot or Marketing Cloud or watched videos, um, it's easy to get caught up in how cool the tools are. And it's easy to um, it's easy to want to just dive right into the deep end of the pool uh, and, and go, go right for the most complex types of automations. And you know what's um, what, what's tricky is that the tools themselves make it fairly easy to build out the automation to just sort of to sort of set up the, the email flows and the decision points. That's that's really a drag and drop process within these tools. But that's not the hard part. That's actually the easy part. The hard part really comes in two areas. So the first area is designing those automation pathways themselves. It's thinking through what are the outcomes that I'm trying to drive with each communication sequence? What's the right timeline or the right cadence for the messages in that sequence? And then um, what if I've got some potentially complex interrelationships between my various pathways? So let's say you set up an automation pathway uh, one for, for new donors and one for new advocates, and then someone donates and takes advocacy action on the same day. How are those pathways now going to intersect and overlap? So a lot of the work in, in getting value out of these tools is taking the time to map all of those various permutations out and think through, uh, think, think through kind of your goals and how you're going to both structure it and measure the outcomes. And then the second thing to keep in mind with automation is that there's a tremendous amount of work that's required to develop content to support these communication pathways. You've got to write copy for every one of those email messages. You've got to have images and graphics. You probably are going to want to do some A-B testing to figure out what's the optimal type of messaging uh, for each particular point in the process. So it's, it's, you've got to be ready to feed the beast from a content perspective when you get into automations. And, and again, it's very, the tools make it very easy to do this, um, but you really have to be sure that you as an organization and, and that your staff members are, are ready and able to, to take on the additional work of using these tools well. So that's why we, we always advocate a walk, jog, run approach. Start out simple. Start out with some triggered sends if you're not doing that already. Um, if you've got that in place, put in place uh, one or two um, one-time scheduled sequences, test your content, get the content right, and then from there start to introduce more complexity. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the big uh, uh, corporations that are doing this very well, they have huge marketing staffs and huge marketing budgets. That they're, they're typically beyond, beyond the reach of, 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 of nonprofits and, and higher ed. So definitely get inspired by what they're doing, but um, be realistic in terms of what your organization can actually take on and, and, and give yourself time to ramp and, and, and grow your capacity uh, as you go along. All right, so, um, so that's it. So that's, uh, that's our Dream to Reality checklist. Um, again, seven key areas that we think your organization or institution should, should pay attention to and be prepared to address as you move towards using your organization's data to help you drive better communications and, and ultimately automated communications. And you know, if I had to really boil it down to a couple of key takeaways, I'd say number one, focus on getting the right data and getting the data right inside of your systems. And then uh, the second piece would be when it comes to automation, just take a walk, jog, run, run approach. Um, no, no, point in, no point in pulling a muscle right out of the gate, start small. Uh, um, you know, get some success under your belt and grow from there. So, so what's next? So a couple of things um, to help you think through uh, the items in this checklist for your own organization, there is a handout that we've created. You can access it from the handout portion of the GoToWebinar uh, attendee panel. Feel free to download that. There's two, there's two sides to the worksheet. The first is around data, helping you do an inventory of data in your organization. Uh, as you as you move towards trying to con trying to consolidate that inside your CRM, and then the second part of it is around automation, helping you 
think through what uh, what examples of automation workflows are that you might try to develop within your within your institution or organization. So please feel free to download that worksheet, um, uh, share it around, uh, give us feedback on that if that's a helpful tool for you. And then secondly, we just like to remind you that uh, that you don't have to go it alone. That um, there's a great community out there that Salesforce has created through the Power of Us Hub of people who are at various stages of this themselves. So, so definitely reach out, ask questions, connect up with peers who, uh, who are on, on a similar journey with you, and, um, and find a good Salesforce partner. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't try to, to take on all of this by yourself. If you're not already working with ACF, we'd love to, to, to be your partner in that, but um, there are lots of partners out there as well. Uh, so, so take advantage of that and, uh, and make sure you've got some good, uh, some good colleagues working with you as you as you move through this process. All right, and with that, um, we'd like to now open it up to any questions that those of you who have who have taken your time to join us today might have for us on this topic, either for for ACF and, and our Dreams Reality Checklist, or questions for Kim Egan. Uh, and, and the experience that she's had to date in, in going through this process at the University of Colorado. And I'll so just, while uh, I've received a question. Oh. Great. Go ahead, Virginia. Okay, this question's for Kim. Uh, Kim, you mentioned a decision about you made whether to use an existing Salesforce org or create a new org. Can you talk a bit more about that decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we. At the University of Colorado, and I'm sure you all can relate to this, um, what we see are schools, colleges, units, departments, we're a broad organization, and, and units will go and, and procure solutions um, without knowing the implications. And so what we're trying to do is to create a 360 degree view of our constituents, and in order to do that, we need one centralized solution. So when we have these pockets of data and these isolated um, solutions across the system, we're not able, able to achieve that. Um, it also affects what we're trying to accomplish in terms of can spam compliance um, and all kinds of other implications as well. So that was one of the main reasons, is really to get everyone using the same solution so we can see when we're looking at one constituent all of their touch points. I like to talk about my boss a lot. He's, um, he has many affiliations. He is, um, obviously he's an, an employee. He's also a donor. He's a grateful patient from our hospital. Um, he's a parent, um, and a parent from a former um, student who's now an alum. So he has all these affiliations. And there was no single system at CU that knew all of that about him. And so as communicators, it's really important for us to know all of those affiliations so we can communicate with him based on who he is. And so that was really the biggest reason. Again, moving away from isolated um, data silos, but really it's all about our constituents. They expect us to know who they are, and we want to communicate with them based on who they are as well. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, Watt, I think this is a question for you. Uh, one of our attendees is asking if you could explain the difference between Marketing Cloud and Pardot. Okay, sure. So, so both Marketing Cloud and Pardot are, are marketing solutions available from Salesforce. And um, they share a lot of things in common, so just in terms of managing email lists and sending out email uh, even you know creating online uh, online forms for for capturing constituent data online things like that. There there there's a lot of similarities. Um, but there there are a couple of key differences, and, and mainly uh, what Pardot uniquely offers is uh, is functionality to help you with lead acquisition. So if your if your email needs or your marketing communication needs are really around uh, acquiring leads of your university and you're looking to acquire uh, acquire new students, um, for example, what Pardot uniquely offers is a lot of functionality around lead scoring and, and lead nurturing and even lead, grade, lead grading to help you, uh, to help really surface for you who are your most, most qualified or engaged or interested constituents. 
So if, you, if your needs are primarily in that area, um, Pardot is, is probably the better tool for you. Then the one thing that Marketing Cloud uniquely offers is a functionality called business units. So this is uh, a functionality that's designed to support really large organizations that need to give different departments or different uh, programs or units within the organization their own siloed access into the data um, so they can all um, communicate effectively but just with their list and just with their marketing assets. Um, so that, that ability to, to create um, business units is, is something that's unique to Marketing Cloud and that that's a feature that, that you, would, you would need and that's, that's probably the direction you should look. Other than that, um, you know, talk, to, uh, talk to your Salesforce account executive um, and they can help, you know, based on your other requirements, they can help steer you in the right direction for, for the tool that's going to be best for you based on both, both features and your, and your budget and your uh, email volumes. Great, thank you, Watt. And we have about five minutes left, and I have just a couple more questions I've received. Uh, this one's for Kim. Kim, how, being such a large uh, electronic communications department, have you handled security at CU to determine who can send emails versus who can create or share email content? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and it was difficult. I, it, it took a long time for us to sort of step back and look at not only the broader Salesforce security, um, but also meet our users, um, meet their needs, um, which often are, hey, you know, I don't want anyone else communicating with, quote unquote, my people. So balancing those two things was very difficult. So what we ended up doing is um, we have our, our campus e-com specialist. Those individuals run the program on the campus. Um, they know the data inside and out, and so they are the ones that they also know their users. So they're creating reports in Salesforce, and they they load those reports to a Salesforce folder, and then we build permissions around that folder. So as a user, um, one user may have access to one folder or three folders, but in total, we have hundreds of folders. Um, and so that way, they're not able to access a report in another user's folder and um, vice versa, other users are not able to access their reports. So that's how we address um, accessing uh, constituent reports to email too. Okay, great, thank you. And um, Juan, I think this is a question for you. Um, do, is it important to have Salesforce CRM between your marketing system and other organizational systems or couldn't you just integrate them directly with the marketing system? That's a great question. Yeah, so in our in our approach today, the assumption we made was that Salesforce CRM would be the right place to aggregate your data. Um, but yes, indeed, you can you can integrate uh, directly from uh, third-party systems into into Marketing Cloud or Pardot. You don't necessarily have to go through Salesforce first. Um, typically, that's a going going through Salesforce is a is a is a better choice because. Um, uh, because then you get the you not only get the benefits of the integration, but you get the benefits of having a CRM. So now, in addition to just being able to use the organizational data to send email, you also now have a consolidated profile for each of your constituents in Salesforce that your staff can begin to use to, uh, you know, to help to help understand who your constituents are and nurture relationships with them in other ways besides just marketing. So, in most cases. That's uh, that's it makes more sense to to have Salesforce as sort of the the consolidation point, but there may be other circumstances where, for whatever reason, that doesn't make sense. And so, yes, you can also integrate directly to to the marketing platforms themselves. Okay, thank you. And this is the last question I have, and Kim, it's for you. Do you have a coordinated centralized calendar for communications at CU? Yes, we, we have two, um, and we're still working. Um, so we ask our users to utilize the calendaring functionality that's native to Marketing Cloud. Um, the only challenge behind that is it's at a business unit level um, viewpoint. Um, Watt sort of explained um, what business units are in Marketing Cloud, and they give you a siloed view of your activity inside Marketing Cloud. So at CU, we have about 150 
business unit. So a business unit might be the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, and so they can only see arts and sciences content and lists and reports and so forth. So with that, they can only see um, their calendar and what they've scheduled to send in the future. So to accommodate that, we also have, and it's very simple, we have a Google calendar on our website. And we encourage folks to go there and, and see any regularly scheduled communications that we have. Um, and then we also encourage our users to let us know to add their communications to the calendar. So it's not perfect, um, but it's what we're doing. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you, Watt. I think we're at time, and those are all the questions that we've received. So again, thank you so much for attending. We will be sending out both the slide deck as well as uh, the audio recording later, and should you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you.